Okay, welcome to the class for this week, um, which, as I said in the introduction, is going to be focused on the films of the feminist uh, queer filmmaker Lizzie Borden. Um, we're going to be mainly looking at her film uh, Born in Flames uh, from 1983. If we have time, I'll talk a little bit about Working Girls from 1986. And unfortunately, I've never been able to get hold of a copy. She does have a third film. She, she has a, a first film. Born in Flames was her second movie. Uh, she has a first film called Regroupings, um, which, I've, is, which is quite hard to find. And I've never been able to get hold of a copy of it. So we will just talk about um, these first two with a main focus on um, on Born in Flames. So yeah, hopefully you guys um, have been able to watch it. I put some, the only subtitles that I could find were French. Um, so I put those online. And yeah, hopefully you find it interesting. Um, I think for me, it's probably... It's probably the most enjoyable film that we've watched um, so far. I think it's pretty fun. I think the points that it makes are very astute. Um, and it's got a real life and an energy to it, which, um, yeah, which is obviously not shared by a film like um, Portrait of Jason, for example. Um... But yeah, as we'll see, I'll just go through some details, some like basic summaries of the movie, and then we will um, watch some of the specific scenes and talk about some of the key ideas that emerge from it. Um, so as you'll notice, it's shot in a kind of documentary style, um, and it was shot on location, which means that it, the places where it's set are the places that the filming took place. Or the filming took place in the locations that the that the film is supposed to be set. Um, yeah, and it took place over several years with a lot of it appearing to be news footage and home video. Um, Borden kind of filmed the scenes when she was able to and on a very low budget. And she also... Something that she talks about in the interviews, which I'll upload to eCampus, is that she engaged in a collaborative writing process with the, with the cast of the film. So she made sure that she, that people who were involved in it um, had a say on the script and had a say on how their characters were um were represented, so I'll, I didn't actually set up any notes, I'll do that now, sorry, I forgot to do that. Um, um, so if you say that you, um, if you have a say in something, um, it means that you It means that you in something or about something. It means that you have inputs into the way that something works or what happens in a particular situation. So yeah, so we can think of Born in Flames as being um, directed by Lizzie Borden, um, but it's a collaborative work too. It's a work that she um, that she undertook with a number of um, different people. What's happening here? There we go. Go away. Okay. Okay, everything's working again. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, and part of the collaborative nature of the film comes through um, in the kind of political conversations that we see happening. And as we'll talk about, language plays a very important role in this film, specifically the relationship between language and action and the way that certain actions are described and the way that the language of characters um, 
reflects their class position and the um, the way that they understand the world, so to speak. Um, yeah, and we have already an important example of the ways in which language functions and the ways in which we can read people's class position, um, which in Born in Flames and in Working Girls is also related in a way to gender and sexuality. Um, the protagonist of Born in Flames or the central character of Born in Flames for the first two thirds of the film is this character Adelaide Norris, who is a queer African American woman activist and community organizer. And her queerness, um, the description that we have of her as being a lesbian, is really foregrounded at the start of the film. And I think it's foregrounded for two reasons. It's foregrounded because she is under surveillance and she's someone who is immediately identified as, um, as queer and as that being a part of who she is. And in some way, from the perspective of the dominant status quo, as being a um, as being a deviant, as someone who is outside of the norm, and it's also important, I think, for for Borden too, because as we and we see this in Working Girls as well, the way in which work is presented in Born in Flames and in Working Girls is very much as something in which one leaves one's own self behind, including one's sexuality and performs actions or tasks which involve entering into a new place and being a different kind of um, different kind of person to the person that one might be in one's private life. And the split between a public life and a private life, although arguably this comes out more in Working Girls than in Born in Flames, is a big um, is a big part of the way that Borden appears to conceive of work under capitalism and capitalism either on a small scale in working girls or on a big scale in Born in Flames is a massive concern of um, of Lizzie Borden. Um, so yeah, we can watch the opening. I'll move this over here so it's easier. We can watch the opening of the film and notice the ways in which different... There's kind of an official language of the movie which is represented, or there's an official language within the movie um, which is more often than not represented by the kind of media channels, and there's a there's more of a kind of countercultural language in the film. There's an organizing language. There's a, there's a language which relates to um, things in a much more concrete way, and we can see this um, this dichotomy, um, which I'm sure there's a similar French word, but a, but a dichotomy is a um, a an opposition between two distinct poles. Um, we can see that these kind of this kind of linguistic dichotomy at work right at the start of the film. So we'll watch it from here. Celebration commemorating the tenth anniversary of the War of Liberation. It's also got a great is a time when all New Yorkers take pride in remembering the most peaceful revolution the world has known. It is time to look back on the events of a decade ago, to consider the progress of the past 10 years, and to look forward to the future. Of America's mystery, so we immediately have this, um, this kind of official media language which is devoted to representing a particular kind of um, a particular kind of memory. The film is a sci-fi film, so it's depicting a futuristic society in which there has been what we would call a socio-democratic revolution um, and in which what is the status quo is a belief in an achieved equality. And throughout the course of the film, we see characters. Adelaide is the, is the leader of a group, uh, but we see lots of other characters too who question the reality of this equality. And we can counterpose the, um, the official media language with, on the, on the one hand, um, 
this radio announcer, Honey, who is someone who immediately challenges this idea that um, equality is really possible um, within capitalism. So we can watch her first speech. A free radio station, a station not only for the liberation of women, but for the liberation of all through the freedom of life, which is found in music. We are all here because we have fought in the wars of liberation. And we all bear witness to what has happened since the war. We still see the depression from the oppression that still exists both day and night. For we are the children of the light and we will continue to fight, not against the flesh and blood, but against the system that names itself falsely. For we have stood on the promises far too long now that we can all be equal under the cover of a social democracy where the rich get richer and the poor just wait on their dreams. Yeah, and this idea of waiting, this idea that we, as Honey puts it, that the rich get richer and the poor just wait on their dreams is something which gets revisited um, throughout the film. <clears throat> and alongside this, um, this language of, um, doo -doo -doo, alongside the language of, we'll go back here, I'll get to the other stuff in a minute, sorry. Alongside the language of kind of liberation, versus the language of a kind of official commemoration and a language which is designed to reinforce the status quo. We also see a language of surveillance um, in the opening scenes too, which is how we actually meet Adelaide for the first time. So we'll go back a little bit. Um, and so immediately following the introduction, the media, we have a white radio station called Radio Ragazzi, which incur which means um, young girls in Italian, I think. Um, and we then are introduced to Adelaide for the first time. And we're introduced to her specifically um, as someone who is under surveillance by the, by the contemporary government. Adelaide Norris, 24. She seems to be the founder of the Women's Army. Her background? Ordinary. Uh, typical of a lot of blacks. Mother domestic. That's her on the left. Her father died when she was a teenager. Eight kids in the family. Adelaide's the oldest. She helped raise the others. Uh, these are some of them. Uh, always a jock, good in track and basketball. Goes to school nights, works construction jobs during the day. Homosexual? Yes. Women's Army appears to be dominated by blacks and lesbians. Um, Norris started as a radical separatist vigilante group three or four years ago. I'd like to know if anyone has any idea. So we have this, um, this presentation of Adelaide as someone who is black, someone who is working class, and someone who is homosexual. And we have this in a... Borden gives this information to us via a kind of depiction of state surveillance. Um... Which at the time the film was made is something that would have been um, very much in place and had been used, um, for example, I don't know if any of you guys have seen the film uh, Judas and the Black Messiah that was released a few years ago, um, but this kind of state surveillance was used especially against the Black Panther Party and against radical groups in the US. Um, as a way of actively disrupting um, radical organization. So we see already um, in the opening moments of the film this kind of... the fact that the supposedly progressive government that we have in the movie um, or that introduces itself at the start of the film is engaging in surveillance of its own citizens, is 
seemingly not very interested in human rights and is also it uses what feels like an obviously racist language and a homophobic language when she's when he says that the woman's army appears to be dominated by uh by blacks and lesbians um and we also hear that Adelaide is someone who is deeply involved in what we would call reproductive labor, um, which is the labor that goes into um, producing the conditions of productive labor. So productive labor in a Marxist sense would be labor which produces value. So the easiest and most obvious way of thinking about it would be labor which is done in a factory, for example. Um, which produces objects which have more value in them than the material that went into making those objects. Um, and those objects can then be sold for a profit. Um, reproductive labor is much more, much more things like cooking, cleaning, childcare, and to an extent sex work, although we can talk more about that in relation to working girls. Um, and it's not consistently thought of as being um, productive in the sense that it may not contribute directly towards the economy. However, one of the big questions in the film is the extent to which that kind of labor is absolutely necessary for the functioning of a capitalist society. Um, and it's a labor that we see that um, Adelaide when we're first introduced to her, she's someone, we're told that she has raised her siblings essentially on her own and that she had eight siblings, or she had seven siblings, sorry, there were eight of them in the family and that both of her parents died young. Um, and as a result of that, she's someone who is very obviously aware of what it means to need resources in order to provide care for people close to you, in order to provide um, the necessary conditions so that people can live a kind of fulfilling life. And the first time that we see her talking in her own voice, we see her at an organizing meeting in which she is talking about keeping open a community center and organizing with other women about how it would be possible to keep a childcare space open. So if we watch this clip. Here's your how we can keep the center open. Because for those of you who are working, what this means is that you're going to have to stop working, stay home and take care of your kids. No, it's going to be impossible for me to stop I'm working. Going. We have to figure out some kind of way we can keep the center open independently. And we see the, yeah, the kind of everyday struggle which is involved when things close down, maybe when the resources aren't there in order to allow, to allow women to go to work while also making sure that their children are safe. And we see that Adelaide is immediately um, involved in these struggles and she's organizing around these struggles and she's doing it partly because she herself is very aware of um, of the necessity of this kind of um, of this kind of organizing. And I think something that um, I won't read entirely from the PowerPoint because I don't think that I need to. Um, but something that we see throughout the film is a, um, is a kind of correlation between or a different interrelations between domestic space and between um, and public space. So something that we notice immediately about Adelaide, the character who is, who is the leader of the most revolutionary group in the film, is that she is someone who the vast majority of her organizing takes place within what we would think of as being domestic spaces. So not obviously political spaces, and I think that this is, um, this is interesting. Um, so in the scene that we just watched, we see her in a kitchen. Um, in another scene later on in the film, we see her in what appears to be a bedroom. 